thank you very much, Michelle and Tobias and Jeremy and everyone for inviting us to present two books to you this morning. Uh, we're actually going to explore um, the program, the ICT4D program, uh, which has just uh, published its book. Unfortunately, it's not landed in Cape Town yet, or it's landed, but it's somewhere else. It's at customs. It's at customs, so we can't, can't let you feel the books, but we do have uh, an e-book, uh, a, a very interactive e-book, um, and this book is called Linking ICTs to, um, to uh, sorry, Connecting ICTs to Development, and uh, the, the editors are here, and I'm going to be asking them a couple of questions, and then as a, a program that came out of that, uh, or project that came out of the program, uh, Tobias and, and Sidi are going to be talking about their book, um, Innovation and Intellectual Property. Yes, and we it, have it. It's not and it's available. <laughs> <laughs> Collaborative Dynamics in Africa. Um, the rest of this day is actually dedicated to, uh, to uh, exploring in more detail the book. So, this session is to, uh, to help us contextualize uh, the book. I'm going to start with uh, Rich and, uh, Richard Fuchs and uh, Laura Elder on my right. Uh, Richard Fuchs was the, uh, the director of the ICT4D program area in IDRC um, over ten. Ten, years, 10 years. Um, it was uh, one of the first um, international programs that established a, and named the program area ICT4D. Laura Elder has been a program leader in that, um, in that space and has continued to program in, in, in information and networks. Um, Tobias and, and Chidi, Chidi, I know you're at Ottawa University working with, uh, with, uh, within the law faculty, you're an IP lawyer and um, have played a central role um, in coordinating the open air contribution uh, around this book and Tobias has been has been the, the program leader of uh, a very large pro program project that uh, ICT4D uh, uh, supported and the open air program leader so I'm going to I'm going to open up the discussion to them is my mic coming on and off I'm so sorry um, I wanted to ask Richard and, and Laurent um, your book our book, <laughs> Linking ICTs to Development. Why was this book necessary? Uh, well, I'm on the, this side of the table, so I'm first. Well, I'll go first. <laughs> and I wrote the introductory chapter to the book, and with Laura on the conclusion. It's great to be here, and it's great to, be, to see such a young and bright audience addressing these issues. 20 years ago, this would not have been possible. People would not be focusing on this. In fact, the title of the chapter that I introduced for the book is called From Heresy to Orthodoxy, how ICTs have become orthodox in development. But certainly, 20, 25 years ago, they were not. So this is really the reason we wanted to put this book together. The book was Laura's idea, is that a lot has happened. The things we take for granted uh, were taken for granted for a really long time. Carl Polyani's Great Transformation described a 100-year process from agriculture to industry. Well, we have moved through a process of being an analog society to a digital society in about 10 years, plus or minus where you are, five or 10. So this is a very interesting process. And we thought that what we had gone through in a very intense, public, and oftentimes heretical way should be put down somewhere, should be written down. Uh, so we think of it as either being a, somewhere between a documentary and an ethnography that helps boil down the work of many researchers in the developing world and to try to put it in some context because there are so many new people with broad ideas and new ideas that we think might benefit from having some reference to what went before them. Huh? Yeah. Um, maybe I should take a step back. It, raise your hand if you uh, know what ICT4D is. OK, so a certain number but there's quite a few of you who actually don't know what it is. Um, so ICT4D is basically Information and Communication Technologies for Development. And it's, it's, um, it's a part of the development field that looks at 
how information and communication technologies, so the internet, mobile phones, can be used for development purposes. And IDRC, which I, I guess I shouldn't assume that you all know what IDRC is, but IDRC is the International Development Research Center. We are one of the funders of, of this conference. Um, IDRC is a, a Canadian crown corporation which focuses on research for development. And it has as a key uh, mandate to uh, empower through knowledge or basically build research capacity in the developing world to solve their own problems. And one of the key areas that we, um, from the very beginning of IDRC, focused on was information and communication technologies and their role in development. Um, so in those early days, uh, we focused quite a bit on issues of access, the digital divide, those kinds of things. And Rich was actually one of the, the, the pioneers in that work. Uh, that work included ensuring that uh, places like Mongolia, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, Vietnam actually had access to the internet. We funded their first ISPs. Um, and so the, the book tells the story of that journey, of those early days of access. But what's really interesting for all of you um, is that quite quickly, through going in that, uh, following that journey, we realize that there's really two digital divides or two access divides. The first one is the telecommunications divide, uh, the divide where essentially people need to have access to the pipes, you could say. And, but the second one is the divide around access to knowledge. Uh, to what extent can people access the content and reuse the content? And that's where our interest in intellectual property came in. And we started supporting quite a bit of work um, in the area of intellectual property and its role in fostering innovation, but also ensuring access to knowledge or not. Um, and so there's a, there's a chapter of the book, the IST4D book, which maybe with some luck we'll actually get to you by the end of this conference, um, that traces the work that we supported in the area of intellectual property that Jeremy De Beer and Sarah Bannerman uh, worked on. It's a very good chapter. Um, and it, um, so it's very interesting to have the two of us, the two books being talked about at the same time because uh, a lot of our work has moved in the direction of understanding the role of intellectual property in the area of access to knowledge. Um, and it's not insignificant, our, our work in this area now. For those of you who were in Rio last year, um, I don't know how many, but I assume there's a good number. You may remember Joe Karaganis' uh, presentation on uh, funders in this space. Um, and he showed a graph of the role of different funders. And uh, for better or for worse, we are one of the, the biggest funders now of research work on intellectual property and its role in development, particularly from a, a technology point of view. Well, the Rich and, and Laurent have actually spoken about 15 years of legacy and work that, uh, that IDRC has funded, and uh, the book is really a capturing of that legacy. Um, and I would say over the last five years, maybe six, the, the area of intellectual property emerged as, um, as something that significant research questions could be, could be asked about challenging initially to get researchers to be interested in it. But thanks to the work of a, you know, a couple of program officers like Khaled Furati at the back there, uh, the, this, this network got started around the issues of access to knowledge. So I'm going to ask Tobias, Tobias now um, to tell us a bit about what, what led to, the, to this new book. This is the second book. Um, from uh, your evolving network. And, uh, and like uh, Rich and, and, and Lara have addressed, tell us a bit about the challenges and the gaps in knowledge that this book addresses. OK, great. Thanks, uh, Heloise. Um, before I answer your question, I actually forgot something uh, to mention uh, while I was talking there. And this was that, and um, I don't think Michelle mentioned that either. We do have a hashtag and a Twitter 
uh, feed, right? So um, please make use of that. Uh, we are using uh, at G Congress and hashtag G Congress, like uh, last year as well. So please feel free to use that. Um, Coming back to your question, so what um, you already mentioned that this kind of issue of intellectual property, and Richard also mentioned that this uh, that this is a kind of a new group that uh, that you're experiencing here. Um, this is this is relatively recent questions that are being asked. Uh, we're moving a little bit away from this kind of paradigm of uh, the, this kind of uh, thinking that uh, the more protection you have, the better it is for development, um, and we're questioning whether the social costs that are associated with uh, creating monopolies are, are worthwhile, the potential benefits that, that comes with incentive schemes that are being created by IP. And, and most people of, uh, here in the room uh, know that already. But because the discussion, I think, is, is a relatively recent one, um, uh, I think we all recognize that IP plays an important role in the context of innovation and creativity, but we just really do not know what this kind of role is yet. We just don't have an answer yet as to whether it is an incentive for innovation and creativity, as many people do say, or conversely, whether it is uh, kind of an impediment to innovation. And I, I guess the truth is, as always, <laughs> somewhere in the middle, right? And uh, I guess this is um, without going too far into what our book has uh, has. Uh, in it because the whole day is kind of earmarked to talk about our findings. I think this is probably one of the key key outcomes of, of uh, our book that uh, um, that while uh, total openness is not required uh, um, to uh, um, um, uh, make uh, uh, development and innovation happen, at least on the African continent, um, protection as such is also not necessarily just an impediment to, to that. So I think this is some, uh, something that we have heard in, in certain cycles before. So we have, uh, we, we have uh, taken knowledge of this or acknowledge, acknowledge these polarized views on intellectual property, um, but we're trying to find an answer to the question as to what role does IP really play uh, for innovation and creativity. And then we kind of create a subset and look at Africa um, instead of uh, trying to, to address that question globally, because we do believe there is different answers to this question uh, for different regions. And then a kind of a sub-question that we asked ourselves uh, to that was, how can IP systems then respond to African context and serve as effective tools that facilitate innovation and creativity? In other words, we're not saying do away with IP entirely, but kind of be aware of the flexibilities that come with it and use it in innovative ways, use IP in innovative ways for the benefit of innovation in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the next, uh, next step then uh, that, that, uh, that we did. And along this project, which, which has now going on for three years or more, and I'm actually quite sorry that some people are sitting there. I'm not really reaching out to you there in the corner. <laughs> um, uh, this is uh, because of the setup of the room. But uh, what I must say is, um, what I, what I found really interesting is the kind of questions that we kind of got into that we didn't uh, think about before. So for example, is it really true uh, that people in, in the global south are less innovative than people in the north? We, in the last couple of years, I heard that so many times that we in the south must be less innovative. And then I asked, why, what made you say that, right? And then people say, because you have less patents, right? <laughs> you look at the numbers you have in, in, in South Africa or on the African continent and uh, just compare it to how many patents are being issued in the global north. So you must be less innovative. So now, is that really true? Obviously, uh, I guess most of the people here in the room will agree that this is not the case and that we are probably having a metrics problem, right, rather than, than, uh, than anything else um, and not so much an innovation problem. Um, sec second question is, and uh, I don't want to use too much time out of that, there's already the bell for that. <laughs> um, uh, the question, another question is, is, for example, IP transfer, tech transfer, um, that, that we talk about in the normal discussion is that suitable for tech transfer between the formal sector and the informal sector. This is something that is not being discussed much. Um, and again, this is something that is highly relevant, perhaps less relevant in the South African context where the kind of informal sector is not as, as big as it is in Afri other African countries, but certainly in other African countries, the informal sector is one of the major employ, employ, uh, employers, right? So we m must uh, see how knowledge is being transferred from one sector to the other. And then, then second, uh, thirdly, uh, what about the whole argument of openness um, as opposed to closed and controlled IP systems? Uh, we, we hear now increasingly, this is a f openness creates fertile grounds for innovation and development. So how do we get this kind of uh, element um, into the discussions? Um, I'm not sure whether we do a second round um, of, of question because I then like I would actually like round, I'd like to, hear to talk more about uh, the project. Chidi's perspective. Uh, you, you um, 
could you could you enlighten us a little bit more on on the regimes that you see and how they uh, impact the challenges that you have addressed in this book? Um, most of the times, what we find is um, how, like Tobias was saying, um, how do you actually talk about Africa and innovation? For most people we work with, um, it looks like a contradiction in terms. Um, innovation, Africa, what are you talking about? And because we've been pigeonholed into traditional knowledge, it's only innovation that happens in Africa. Um, as if traditional knowledge is an antithesis to innovation. And so we, one of our strategies which we have adopted, instead of talking, like Terrell was saying, all in terms of theory at global levels, we wanted to really um, let ourselves go right into the field and begin to map the traction point at which intellectual property hits the ground in, in African context. And one of the things we found is that as much as there is some degree of unity in terms of uh, commonalities in cultural practices in Africa, Africa is quite a diversified continent. And even intellectual property, if you pigeonhole it into patents, trademark designs, you can't even plot the kind of creativity that goes on in Africa. And even if you look at trademarks, are you talking about geographical indications or are you talking about some other context where people leverage on innovation that happens in our continent? So the essence of our project is to really now go into the field, have a first-hand interaction with agents of innovation and creativity in our continent and begin to have a sense as to what they do or what they expect and how they have used IP in order to leverage on their innovation capabilities. And so it's, it's, it's like something we're going to be talking about most of the day in terms of what we have found. And Tobias couldn't have said it better. What we have is a metrics problem. How do you measure innovation? in a civilization and society where most of the creative works that happen are based on informal interaction. And, and so this is really an attempt to begin to have an African voice in the narrative of innovation and creativity. Mm -hmm. Innovation and, and intellectual property seem to, uh, seem to go hand in hand. And uh, the ict for d program Rich was a very innovative program. How, how did IP emerge as an issue? I think we were kind of uh, pre-IP in a way. Uh, I, I'm reminded of, uh, I think it was a Chris Christopherson song that included, if you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. And if you haven't got words, images, and uh, music that is you own, then why do you care about intellectual property? So we saw it as our mission to help with the issue of connectivity, ability to share and disseminate, and as Laura was referencing, the ability to produce knowledge, mm -hmm. to produce things that people would want to share. And that's where we kind of, and so I, I, Laura and Heloise were most, always much more concerned about intellectual property than I was. My eyes would go glassy, because I was thinking, we're, we're not ready for that yet. Obviously we're ready for that now. But then I, we would kind of have disagreements about whether that was time for this. Uh, and I'm also reminded, uh, I, before I came to IDRC, I was a consultant. And I'm a consultant again. And I used to write things. I used to take pictures. And I'd share them on the internet. And I'd find that they'd be showing up places. <laughs> and they wouldn't have my name associated with them. Or the fact that these were some my labor, my imagination, my creativity. And it wouldn't really bother me. And then I was in a room where a wise man uh, said, in the information age, what you give, give away comes back to you many fold. Mm -hmm. And I thought very seriously about that. And I think he's right. And I think of Google and Mozilla and Facebook and all the things we get for free that are given away. That is the business case of the information economy. And those who are working hard to put a fence around it, 
are, I think, fighting a losing cause. It, it, they'll, go, they'll lose slowly and gradually. But in the end, the commons, I believe, is the business model of the information economy. So Laura, that's really where the new program got started, right? Based on an open innovation model, or open ICT for D model. Tell us a bit about that continuation. Um, sure. So the, the um, IDRC's uh, kind of newer focus is looking at the whole issue of uh, open development, um, a concept that we've tried to theorize a little bit, trying to understand how openness plays a role in achieving development outcomes. And this is why um, the book that Open Airs produces is so important, because it starts to put in um, some evidence or some thinking as to how you get there. Now, that's a really complex question. It's bigger than intellectual property. It's actually about mechanisms. It's about how people act. It's about how uh, people do things, you know, from crowdsourcing uh, reports of sexual harassment in Egypt to uh, all kinds of uh, grassroots uh, innovations. And this, this does seem to be a growing issue. The, the use of um, internet tools, mobiles, the internet, to innovate to solve development problems. Um, so that's what we're really interested in. But at the same time, you can't just uh, focus on the innovations. You have to understand the context within which these innovations are happening. So that's about regulation. Um, and so we continue to look at issues around uh, regulation on the telecommunication side, so the, the access to the network side, but also regulation in intellectual property. What is uh, the necessary balance to actually make these innovations that are useful flourish? Mm -hmm. And as Tobias said, there's no one-size-fits-all. There's no one-size-fits-all uh, solution uh, to these things. So trying to understand in a very you know, our dream would be to understand in a sectorally specific way what kind of regulation impedes or strengthens innovation or access to knowledge or whatever outcome you're looking for and which ones do not and ensuring that there is the capacity and the competencies, um, all of you basically, in the various countries that you come from, um, that those competencies exist to either challenge your uh, regulators or inform your policymakers about uh, these issues. So that's that's what our, our program does. Um, and maybe a, a small anecdote, and you can you can help me out with this, Rich. But so that you get a, a sense of what some of the the, the interesting um, lessons about what happened in our field is this whole issue of um, things that were done that were unlegal. Okay. And and I, I, I not yet illegal. Yeah, but but the term was the term was unlegal, that that uh, a partner of ours, Ono Perbo, would use, and I, I realize that I'm in a room with a lot of lawyers, and that I have to be very careful of what I say, maybe. But um, so uh, Ono Perbo was a um, an internet um, innovator like no other from Indonesia. Um, and he would basically go out and hack into telecommunications networks so that he could um, set up Wi-Fi networks, community Wi-Fi networks all over Indonesia. Um, and he ensured that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, actually had access to the internet in a fairly low cost way. Now, this was interestingly not legal also, at that time, wasn't really illegal. It was what he called unlegal, <laughs> or pre-legal, maybe, <laughs> or pre-illegal. Um, and this is the space that we're working in, especially in the IP space. There's piracy, there's informal practices, and there's formal practices that are uh, happening in the, the regulatory spectrum. So, because there is so much happening in the unlegal space, we need to understand it. And if something is happening there that is 
useful and important and actually has benefits, we have to find ways to uh, spur it on. And um, again, that, those are the kinds of things that we're very interested in, in understanding and helping to support people who, who want to uh, better understand those issues. Rich, do you want to add to this uh, well, uh, zone Oprah, of innovation? He's an amazing fellow. Uh, I refer to him as a, a liberation technologist, as opposed to a liberation uh, He's a PhD in physics. He uh, taught uh, at the uh, premier engineering school in, in Indonesia, in, in Institute of Ban Technology, Bandung. And he was on the former president's blue collar panel to create a, uh, a vision for Indonesia and the information society, and then he quit. And he decided to become a, a, a technology rebel. And he would go to hotels and uh, rent a room, and you know, three and 400 people would be in the room, and he would show them how to build Wi-Fi cheap, almost free, using walks. And so they could, uh, walks and cans as parabolas. And uh, then he would write about that and put it on the internet and let that information be available for free. And he would charge them $5 to come to the room. And then hardware manufacturers would come to him and give him technology to use in his demonstrations and to put on his website. So as a case, he was able to build you know, a, uh, a sustainable, modest enterprise for him and his wife, tremendously changing the landscape in Indonesia in terms of connectivity. When the new and current president got elected, he had 100 things he was promising to do within 100 days, as presidents elect will, will, will do. And one of the things they did was to liberate or deregulate the 2400 megahertz, megahertz spectrum, uh, which is the last mile spectrum. And as a consequence, and that was Ono Provo's doing. They called Ono up, brought him up to the president's office, shook his hand, put this out in the press release. This is one of our 100 things. And he was then a kind of on sabbatical with us in Ottawa, helping to take some of his stuff in Bahasa Indonesia and put it into English and put it on the web. And uh, as a consequence of that, the penetration of the internet beyond the major capital, major cities in, in Indonesia exploded. So. No, again, this is an example where openness creates opportunity. Well, actually, we hosted on a Pervo at our conference in 2003 when Wi-Fi certainly could not be transmitted over a, a telecom boundary, and we had good reason to arrest him. Do you remember? Yes, in a pink <laughs> shopping cart. It was not illegal. It was illegal. <laughs> But Ono Pervo became a, a guru in South Africa and helped a lot of people develop uh, community networks. So can I ask you, Tobias, how the conversation is, is, is circulating around ICTs. And I know that your, your entry point into IP is around ICTs. Tell me a little bit about how ICTs have played out mm -hmm. in, in your thinking and your book. Um, I, I can actually just, uh, just pick up on what Richard earlier said and when he was referring to the early discussions in the field when you talked about ICTs and IP didn't really, you didn't really bother, right? It was pre-legal. <laughs> um, so I think um, uh, obviously um, why you started thinking about uh, the issue of ICT, I suppose, was that, uh, that you wanted to make uh, knowledge more accessible. This was the starting point for all this. And you identified ICTs as, the, as a tool for making that possible, right? So, and you, you realize the infrastructure is not there, so you need to do something about it. How do you rectify these kind of things? And that was what this research was geared towards. And I think now we've almost gotten to a point where, where we have, not quite, I know there's a lot of projects still doing stuff about ICTs, and I'm not saying that they, they should not continue doing what they're doing. I think that is super important still. But I think we have reached a point now where we realize even if we have the infrastructure there, uh, what is all the infrastructure worth if we don't have the content, right? Mm -hmm. And that is when it becomes legal. Then we actually need, when we need to ask this legal question as to uh, how to free up content on those available ICT tools. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of thinking that, uh, that uh, um, that I have constantly in my mind and where I try to, to get people together in one room and talk about these things. We are just really, if we talk about access to knowledge, IP really is just one element. So is ICT. There is many other elements in there and we are just focusing on that one element. But, but we believe IP is an increasingly important element mm -hmm. in this discussion and this is why we think this book that, uh, that we, uh, we are publishing now 
is timely. But as was mentioned earlier, this is not a comprehensive book. It's, an, it's a start. So we are not looking at all elements of intellectual property. We're trying to spread it as widely as we can with the resources that we had in the last couple of years. So we have about like 13 case studies, I believe, in the book, looking at different elements of intellectual property. We have case studies on copyright. We have case studies on patents. We have case studies on geographical indications. Um, and, and, and many more, um, traditional knowledge plates. But we, for example, we don't have a case study on access to medicine. Now, some people may say, especially because I know there's a track on that here, may say that this is an oversight. But uh, there's two reasons for that. The one is that we um, basically, uh, how we started this pro project is that we issued a call for for um, kind of research in this area. And uh, it so happened that nobody put forward a call to look into access to medicine issues. But we also believe it's relatively well explored already. So there's other very good projects that do it actually better than, than we probably would have been able to do that. So what I'm trying to say, neither is IP the only issue, nor is the book that we are presenting you with now uh, containing all the IP issues that, that you can, uh, can see. But I think it is, um, it is starting a very important conversation that then will link big, big, uh, back to ICT because, as I said, these, th these two go, uh, don't go without each other. There's no point of having the content without the, uh, the ICT, but vice versa, and there's the <laughs> bell again. <laughs> <for you. laughs> um, uh, Misha, so are you here? So? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so, with that I leave it, I guess. Thank you very much, because it gives uh, it gives Chidi, uh, Chidi, you uh, you have the last word here. Yeah, we were. Okay. Um, I, I would like to hear from you uh, in 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 those in those uh, uh, dynamics of IP. You know, patents, copyright, geographic indicators. Wh which which one did you find the most interesting in the exploration in this book? Essentially, our discussions on patents may have to be filed away. And let's even talk about some of the stuff we found or trying to, to put our fingers on. Um, one thing about our project that I find uh, quite distinct from relative literature um, is the whole idea of case study and the whole idea of using in a disciplinary approach to exploring intellectual property. Not only do we have um, in a disciplinary team of uh, research people on ground, but also when you look at the issues we are talking about, in order to understand uh, people's attitude to openness, innovation, and all that stuff, we think about the social, cultural, economic context in which people operate, because that is really very pivotal in terms of determining their approach to, to openness in innovation context. <laughs> so I don't want the bell to go again. Um, the next thing to say is that our, our case study method is essentially based on um, laying the groundwork for valuing and measuring the innovation that goes on in African context. We have a bigger project, which is actually a kind of scenarios building, looking into the next step. Uh, 10, in next um, 20 years as to the interaction of openness, innovation, dynamics, and what implications they have for policy making. So the case studies are relevant for present decision making, but looking into the future, the dynamics as we'll be speaking about that tomorrow. So let me not let the bell ring now, and so <laughs> we can, can be done. <laughs> well, that leaves me uh, the pleasure of thanking you for uh, for opening up the conversation and setting a stage for, you know, exploring in more depth the issues that uh, this particular program has uh, addressed. But thinking within the context of uh, how ICTs has opened up a whole new gamut, a whole new can of worms, actually, for us to continually keep ourselves busy. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yes, my name is Anke Weisheit. I am Director Excel Hot Consult Production and Indigenous Knowledge. I would say some of the so-called innovation protection methods in Africa, which we have not discussed now, is trade secret. Most of the IP traditionally are handled as, I, uh, as trade secret. For example, traditional healers make concoctions so that you don't know which plants are actually there. And the knowledge transfer is a trade secret to a close group of relatives or selected people who get it. So there is a patent system, a traditional indigenous patent systems or pro protection of, of knowledge there. 
but it's maybe not written, so it's not, not available for the researchers. Thanks. <coughs>